I, I won't try and, uh, with my very poor German, um, to actually say that, but it actually means that uh, under certain circumstances, um, um, if you uh, if your mind can't understand things, then you really don't have a mind to lose. Um, <laughs> so it's uh, it's quite a it's quite a, uh, a subject in itself, really. But uh, I think it sums the whole thing up quite clearly. Um, I think uh, the the important thing is is to understand who actually. A little bit about the history of Schreber, because he's he was quite a character, uh, or rather he wasn't, but his family certainly. Well, he was, but his family also were. In terms of his history, his so-called delusions, how they link with art and surrealism, and um, how that in itself is linked to magic, occultism, and shamanism. No, I'm, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an artist, I'm not a mystic, by any stretch of the imagination. And um, I'm, I feel privileged here to be here, to be part of this institution, uh, be part of this presentation and celebration of what these uh, artists have been doing. Because it fits so well in to, um, to Daniel Borchreva, and certainly to Doe's uh, take on the whole matter. Um, now, his childhood and process um, was very much um, uh, traumatic, to say the least, or some say it was traumatic. His education, he, he, was, he was quite, a, quite a, a fascinating person. He, um, he was one of the most intelligent people you could ever meet, really, um, and he uh, managed to very, very quickly ra ra rise to the position of judge. Uh, the second highest judge in Germany. Um, he married quite late at the age of 36, I think it was, um, to a 21-year-old Otto Sabine Beer. Now, she was of lesser carriage than he was, social status than he was. Um, but they certainly found something between them. Um, but the family didn't like that at all. They thought it was a complete misalignment. Um, but soon afterwards, when he failed to, in his bid to uh, get into um, the Reichstag, uh, he started to have his first illness. But the whole thing is littered with tragedy, as you will see later on as I go through this particular thing. And um, there was, he wrote a book of his madness called The Memoirs, the uh, Denkwürdenkeiten, uh, 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 now, he then used that to gain his freedom, which he did successfully. Um, now, what he actually said in it is well covered, um, but what isn't in it, unfortunately, of a family, of, is the third copy, which the family kept very, very private because of what he might say about the family and what he might also say about a friend of theirs who happened to be part of the um, uh, the uh, the, uh, uh, the, fa the family members of the Kingdom of Saxony. There's there's lots of there's lots of various. The third, third chapter is absolutely not printed and it can't be found anywhere. We found bits and pieces of it. We had I, I, you know we picked up bits and pieces. That was due to a chap called De Freese. But anyway, this is this is the family portrait. Now there's Paul at the back, looking quite morose, to say the least. Um, there's um, Anna, uh, Sidney, um, there's Gustav, very close to the father, and uh, there's uh, Clara Klaus. Now, uh, Sidney, the youngest, was the only one not to get married, and she was said to have been not quite right in the head. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, poor old Gustav uh, took the gentleman's way out and shot himself at, the, at quite a fairly young age. I think about 20, 20 28, 30, 32, I think. 
uh, because he was paralytic, uh, but some suspected syphilis, which is strange after, after what uh, we have to say about his father. Uh, now, his father was uh, Daniel Chotlov uh, Schreber. The mother was Pauline Schreber Hasse. Uh, now, uh, Daniel Paul, who was born in 1842 and died in 1911. Gustav was born, uh, he had two, two older, uh, two, two older, he had a, a brother that was older and a sister that was older, 1839 and 1840. Um, she did get married to somebody called Jung, but not the Carl Jung, but uh, of a similar ilk. Um, and Gustav, unfortunately, did shoot himself in 1877, which poor old Paul felt very sad about, really. Not, not overly, but he felt guilty. Uh, so they, so, so it is written. Clara married the district judge, and Sidney remained unmarried. And uh, at a later time, uh, it became apparent that the whole family structure was. You'd think that um, now he was very despotic. Uh, he he was he was the he was the boss in the family. He was there was a method to everything. There was a regime to everything. He built contraptions to build up the kid to bring up the kids. Uh, he was highly despotic. Um, it was, and uh, a friend of mine, Morton Shutzman, who wrote a book about soul murder, said uh, you could call it a household totalitarianism, which it absolutely was. Now, in the family, at one point, the family got larger and larger. There was Aunt Fanny, <laughs> the um, the mother's uh, sister, who moved in. Uh, there were female maids and child carers. Apart from the five children of Moritz and Pauline, there were older, uh, there were other uh, child boarders that uh, Moritz took on from a separate clinic. So, um, there we have uh, Moritz and Sabine's on the right. Uh, that's taken from a chap called uh, Zweider Thane, who's the, the godfather of Schreber at this current time, um, or, or Schreber knowledge at this current time. Um, they now. In many of the films so far, like Shockhead Soul and other things like this, he's been expressed as uh, as if he had a good marriage. Well, I, I I have my questions about that. But anyway, Paul, at the age of 36, married Otley Sabina Hippier. Uh, now, she was, uh, as you can see, she was uh, 15 years younger. Uh, Sabine's father who was a, an opera house director. Sabine's mother, uh, she was the daughter of a male comedy scriptwriter. What they had to laugh about in those days, I don't know, but there we are. Um, six stillbirth married, but Sabine had six miscarriages, stillbirths, in fact they were. She was, uh, she was diabetic, but that had anything to do with it, we don't know. And the last stillbirth was a boy. Um, but when he actually, after the second illness, when he came out of Sonnerstein, they adopted uh, Friedlin, who was age 13, and she became a nurse, married Dr. Lieber, and um, Friedland had a daughter, etc., um, etc. Et um, the only thing is, Friedlin um, said that Paul was far, far more loving. I mean, quite surprising for somebody with, with such a supposed delusion and uh, totally, uh, and, uh, and so, so called diagnosed paranoid schizophrenia. Than, um, than his mother. He was, he was more a mother to uh, Friedlin than Sabine herself. Uh, now, the marriage was thought to be a misalliance by Schreiber. Uh, now, Daniel Paul, as I said, was very gifted, highly intelligent, academically brilliant, and uh, he writes of the relationship with Sabine in his memoirs uh, by saying, after recovering, I spent eight years with my wife, on the whole, quite happy ones rich also in outward honours, and marred only, from time to time, by the repeated disappointments of our hope of being blessed with children. Now, after six to eight miscarriages, I suppose that would be a bit of a disappointment. God knows what effect it had on her. Anyway, relationship, the, the relationship was quite stressful uh, at, during, at the time when he became ill, because he became ill on three separate occasions. The relationship was described by researchers as loving, but they did keep faith with each other in, 
in strange sort of ways. It will in many ways, in, uh, but very difficult to actually define um, because very little is actually written. But from friends of the, the Young family, uh, some research has been done, some paper letters have been found, etc. So they they were in love with each other and they tried to keep faith with each other. But because it was so stressful, Sabine didn't know where she was going to get any money to live on, um, etc. She was writing to Paul Fleischig. And uh, who was the first doctor to take care of uh, of, uh, of Paul uh, in the first illness? And she was uh, saying, "I really don't know what to do. Give us, you know, please help." Um, and she was very reluctant to have him home again. Now she said it was on the basis of what he called the bellowing miracle, because every time he got very angry, or every time the voices started, he'd jump on the piano and start bellowing. Uh, Paul refused, now, at one point or other, Paul refused to sign the papers. Because when she went along to Sonnenstein, he refused to sign, she refused, he refused to sign the papers granting her access. So he went into a hell, a hell of a rage. And she, he threatened her with divorce. That wasn't apparently the first time. Now, and according to a letter to Fleischig, it was a repetitive threat. threat. Sabine was described as childish and primitive in her writing from uh, a letter to Fleischig saying, you know, I really don't know what to do and uh, the rest of the family don't think I'm, you know, capable of making any decisions for myself, etc. And Sabine was quite uh, pivotal. She was then, then, with a wink from um, uh, Fleischig, she was given the idea, well, i tell you how to get money. Go and make him involuntary and uh, you, know, uh, you know, and it putting the comedy status status on him, and he will not, he'll have to pass his salary on to you. Now this she did, and this is what she got. And uh, now we're coming back to the father again, who was pretty insistent, who was pretty dom domineering in Paul's life. Uh, Daniel Gottlob, uh, uh, Daniel Gottlob, uh, Moritz Schreiber. He was quite a guy. <laughs> wow. Paid a go, leading orthopedist uh, and physician, um, and posthumously became, posthumously became the spiritual father of the Schreiber Gardens, which still exist today. Um, he was into calisthenics, <laughs> um, and the allotments are s still around uh, the cities in, uh, in, in Germany now. Uh, he wrote about 40 books, the most famous one which was the Calipedia, and in indoor gymnastics for home and school. Uh, he invented strict rearing methods and contraptions for healthy posture and mind, and true nobility, for, and for true nobility of soul, no less. Uh, now, about the mother, there was little known. There was, uh, it's, she came from an upper class, very rich family, had a very overbearing mother, and for both of these people, status and local standing uh, of their husbands was extremely important. In fact, they had a couple of names. They had a couple of streets that they, they refused to live, that, that they only lived in because it contained the names of Moritz and, uh, and, uh, and somebody else they knew, etc. Now, two of the suitors to um, uh, Pauline were Mendelssohn and Goethe. Uh, now, I think Mendelssohn took her attention more than anybody else because uh, when she married, she then, uh, Pauline then married Moritz. Um, now, Moritz, who was a pretty small man and not even a professor, uh, couldn't really match up to Mendelssohn and Goethe, really. So he started writing his 40 books and uh, became a very leading pedagogue. Uh, and uh, um, uh, he, he, he was a director of an institute, etc. But the following poems written by Paul may help to clarify how his, um, how his mother was. These remarks would be of little interest. If you, these were, this was an actual poem that he wrote. These remarks would be of little interest if you did not find their echo in Schreiber himself. They resound in some poems that Schreiber dedicated to his mother, and which were recently discovered by Israels. Hans Israels was a, a researcher into Schreiber. Regarding his mother's choice of place to live, and taken from um, Paul's poem, it was not chance that you took residence there, at this particular place to live. Uh, usually only professors were renters. Uh, the princess's house. So there was a certain rage he had against his mother, even though he was identifying you know, with a feminine sort of uh, 
aspect of it. Uh, how proud the name Laden with memories that echo in your soul. Regarding what Schreiber understood of his mother's childhood, school was disdained. It was considered elegant to retain a tutor instead. He praised, he, he praised, he scolded when necessary. He taught you and long, and long with you, your siblings. Your head was burdened almost more than proper with everything that belongs to education, with world and natural history and foreign languages. It's still probable now in your old age, because he wrote this when she was just a year off dying, actually, a couple of years off dying. Uh, regarding what Schreiber understood of his parents' marriage, however, he wrote, uh, thus now and then a suitor also appeared, which he referred to as Mendelssohn or Goethe, rich, uh, ready to attach himself to you for life. One, uh, but when Mendelssohn got married, one rapturous, uh, uh, one rapturous, one swore solemnly that uh, only united would you find happiness. Rejection was then distressing for the poor man, etc., etc., etc. Now that was the first doctor that treated him because he had three illnesses. Now the first started when he didn't quite make it into the Reichstag. Now, these were the apparatuses that Moritz actually devised for his children. I don't know if you can imagine ever being in one of these, but it's not the happiest experience for any child, I shouldn't think. But anyway, that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> well, anyway, so. Now, that is a program in Germany where that sort of thing is still advocated. So I stuck that in there, I thought that would be quite it. And he actually used that in the gymnasium that he built, that sort of structure, to walk the child round in that type of belt. He put, he put a strap across the child's head with screws on it, so he could only glance in one particular direction. Um, now, Schreber's other... Now, this is the thing, you see. Now, this is now we're getting a bit psychoanalytic here. His god, in his, in, in his delusions, was fashioned out of language and extreme ecstasy. I mean, if you think of... Lacan talked about assurance, and it was, uh, that, that's how, that's how he, uh, it's like the not completing of sentences. When you complete a sentence, then you sort of get a, a you know, like, then you begin to understand what the beginning meant. And that's, that was the assurance. Uh, the desire for the mother became, but he couldn't actually say that. I mean, this is the edible part. Desire of the mother... He transposed it, he, he displaced the name of the father, and the name of the father in locus of the other, the other, of course, being the mother in this particular case, which was later Sabine. Uh, and the name of the father, uh, symbolization of mother's absence or presence. Now, when something, it's the lack of something that's important here. When a child is taken away, there's a lack. So it's there's an ability to hallucinate into that empty space, that void, that abyss. And that was possibly something to do with it. Um, now, the first illness was in 1884, following defeat in elections. Uh, his bid to the Reichstag, his first depressive illness, he went for a water cure. In 1884, he was admitted under Paul Fleischig's care to Leipzig University. It's a very nice name, isn't it? But it was just a... It was a crunken, uh, a crunken uh, clinic. Anyway, uh, this was something I actually picked up. I thought it was rather... Poignant. I mean, the devils and the etc. And how he saw himself. Uh, now, the madness. He left Fleischer's clinic and resumed his judicial duties uh, in 1886. But then, in 1993, he woke up with these two dreams. First of all, he dreamt his illness had returned, and second one was the most peculiar. One morning. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, 1893. <laughs> yes, my my apologies. Yes, he's still alive. He's still there. He's still there. Yeah, that's what it was, you see. I don't think he was there then. Well, not really. One morning, half awake and half asleep, he dreamt that he was there. Then a sudden, well, not really. One morning, half awake and half asleep, uh, a feeling struck him as highly peculiar that it must be rather pleasant to be a woman succumbing to sexual intercourse. In fact, he was quite taken with this idea for rather a long time. Um, I mean, we've all been there. Well, some more or less. Uh, <laughs> he uh, no, I didn't say that. Um, I said. <laughs> Uh, the, the madness manifest was his second illness was uh, after the after the Fleischig he went back to Fleischig again 
His admission was from uh, to March 84, sleeplessness, anxiety, suicidal depression, no supernatural contact with God. Great stuff. Could have been a, you know, he could have got out of that, maybe. But because of the way they were treating people and because they had no, no clue and understanding of what actually when it was going on with him, he called it hypochondriasis. And in March 1894, 1894, onset of con- the onset of contact with God, soul murder, and Belturkang, uh, I said that with a Dutch accent, and that's because I lived too long in Holland, I think, uh, and this is the end of the world. Um, now, then he went, for, three she thought, oh, what's all this? I don't want anything to do with this. So he sent it to, to, to Pearson's asylum, which was called Devil's Kitchen in Korsweich, uh for two weeks. And there, Paul thought, I think I'm very dangerous and ill. <laughs> Which, now, so, Pearson tended to agree, so he ended up at the state asylum, uh, at Sonnestein, which was known by most people as Devil's Castle. By, it was known by the inmates, it was known by the villagers, etc., etc. Now, he was admitted there in 1894, and in the, on December the 20th, 1902, he was released, which was Bastille's day, actually. Fine, strange enough. Now, the example of the symptoms were quite interesting. His delusions involved... Now, these are fascinating. He wasn't just mad... He wasn't just a madman. He had an amazing amount of um, uh, religious knowledge. Uh, invented, he invented fantastic and fantastic cosmology. Uh, uh, for, he talked about anterior and posterior courts of heaven, uh, on Zor- Zoroastrian gods, the lower Ariman that uh, uh, Nick was talking about, and um, the superior god Ormond, the state of blessedness, untested and tested souls. And soul murder came about, because he thought his soul was going to be murdered, by a crisis in heaven, because God didn't really understand human beings. He only dealt with corpses. Rotten corpses. Well, you know, well, it doesn't matter, I won't get into that. Um, and so there, then came the idea of fleetly, fl- he thought that people were fleetingly impoverished men. Uh, not real. But this could have been related to the diagrams that his father actually drew. You know, when you're standing up there and things like that, you know, sort of, it's that sort of thing. Very, very strange things. And uh, so to him, these were... You know, like just, they weren't real, so they could have been this. He also had a world redeemer delusion. Now, he, di- he didn't, he, 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 he wanted to be turned into a woman, because Ariman could do that, because Ariman was the god of night, of moon, etc., which is linked to some mystical concepts, but doesn't matter. Uh, by, well it, well, it does, but a bit later on, by, uh, uh, by sun rays, to, to procreate a new world race. Sorry about this, I've got to rush. He only, he was chosen by God, uh, and he was chosen by God as the highest seer. Now, Swedenborg called this the, the highest heisten seer. And as I said, God only dealt with corpses, he didn't really understand people. And then he had auditory visual hallucinations. And at the table one day, with the director of the, uh, he was hearing these voices saying, fancy a judge allowing himself to be fucked. What would you, what would your wife think of you? And uh, so, he, anyway, he learned God's language. He saw bears with very strange and terrifying eyes. Um, and little men that tried to keep his eyes shut. Now, all of this is very, very parallel to what, how his father brought him up at the contraptions he put him in. Uh, now, that's, that's what more, more Niederland and, and Schatzmann say. But that happened people disagree with it. Anyway, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not so sure about it myself. Um, so anyway, in the second phase of the second illness, he, there was a plot to destroy his soul, which was the soul murder. His soul was to be destroyed, he was to be turned into a woman, handed over to, the, handed over to someone, not Flesig, but someone, to be sexually abused and his body left to rot. And Flesig's soul, Paul's enemy, um, who actually his wife put on the bedroom table after he got home from Sonnestein, so if you can imagine, sort of doing your du- husbandry duties, and what was the old devil is looking straight at you. Never mind. Um, <coughs> uh, Paul's enemy got into heaven. And, uh, anyway, um, 
Paul's enemy, he believed, the flea shake, had gone into heaven, seduced God to be complicit, uh, talked God in to, uh, talked God into a plot uh, to kill um, uh, Shreve of Soul, and later Paul uh, said he realised it was God who was the instigator and not flea shake. Uh, later he accepted the female transformation made by the rays, Ariman, uh, to be the re- etc. etc. Uh, but there was, at the same time, there was a real plot going on between um, uh, when he said no to Sabine to get access to his salary with a wink from Fleischig, Carl Edmund Werner, who was Paul's old boss, suggested to Sabine to file for incompetency, st- incompetency status, which he succeeded in, and it allowed her access to the salary. Uh, so immediately he, f- he formed a forced impact legally and psychiatrically with the particular regimes that were going on. He was being persecuted in real time. Uh, so this somehow or other started getting into, started being reflected in his, into his so-called madness. Um, right, anyway, keep going, yes. That sort of time, yes. Uh, it was previously fortress, called Devil's Castle. Uh, in 90, uh, this is the thing again. In the National Science Socialists in 1940-41 murdered 1,320 uh, 1, people uh, who were unfit for work. ACOS. Uh, the retarded, handicapped, and mentally ill. Would high, um, and the question is, would high court appeal judges or seamstresses have been spared? Seamstresses, that uh, become clearer later on. Shall we go on to the next thing? Yeah. Uh, these are the examples of the miracles. I'm sure you can read through them fairly quickly. Yes, yeah. Uh, now, Gross was the first person to speak about him, before Freud. And uh, he said, uh, uh, the function of the brain is the preservation of the successes and synchronous coordination of all nervous function towards which we call consciousness. The question was, Paul's madness, uh, was Paul's madness an attempted self-cure? Is any madness an attempted self-cure? But anyway, that's uh, perhaps going off the point. Freud thought Gross as, uh, as brilliant as Jung, but, well, he was a bit of a lad. Uh, he tended to de- take, to, he just tended to transgress uh, in various ways. Freud, anyway, Freud made an analysis of Paul Schraver. Uh, he saw the paranoia was the, uh, as a homosexual desire for the father, fear of castration, and an, Oedipal, oh, well, an inverted Oedipal conflict. I do not love him, I hate him. The contradiction must have run through the unconscious, however, this cannot be allowed for the paranoiac. This just isn't acceptable if you're paranoid. Symptom formation in paranoia requires the internal perceptions. Feelings have to be replaced by external perceptions. Thus, I hate him transformed by projection to he hates me, which will justify me hating him. Unconscious feelings, blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Freud, in, uh, Freud in a private letter to Jung, the wonderful Schraver ought to have been made a professor and director of a mental asylum, etc. Next one. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, now, these are the various interpretations. Baumeyer, Wiedelund, Sch- Schatzmann, Israel's Bosch of Defeats, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and Sato, funnily enough, yes. Um, these, uh, yes, keep going, yes. Uh, right. Um, they were a remarkable. Where are you going? Where are you going, Richard? I'm, new, I'm uh, you know, I know people are seeing, I'm already five minutes well over time. There's too Someone, much to say. Hey, someone's going to come through that door and say you're, it's over. Okay, well... Keep on going, all right? And let's hope they don't... Well, they will. I, 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 if you want me to, I mean, I can yeah. just stop now, really. No, uh, I think you need to get to words, if you can. Yes, I'd like to. I'd like to. Right. Uh, shall we, shall we shoot through? Bit. Now, the point is, yeah. on the basis of this, um, Sato and Max Ernst and Breton, uh, there's a thing that he wrote... Don't write on the, in, a, in a, a graffiti room in Paris. There was like, don't write on the shitters, shit on the writing. <laughs> uh, in the course of the, upper, of the of that unique night, which Nick's have well put, put forward, um, he meditated on Luba, Luda, um, and then he sort of found an interspace between mysticism and psychoanalysis. He also talked about um, the Savage Man Friday in the kitchen, uh, serving the parlours where Crusoe used to frequent. And said that mysticism was like watching Friday doing it. He couldn't be part of it, but he could not be part of it. So it's an interspace between subjectivity and objectivity. But that's 
philosophical and that, something else. Uh, but he did say that Mr. Simmons' psychoanalysis had three meeting points. The distinction between a statement and a speech act. For example, a corpus and an act of the subject. Now, this was well established in the 16th century century, but it doesn't matter, 16th and 17th century. Um, now, he also said that re uh, separation and death, which is very Lacanian, is prominent in both mysticism, mysticism and psychoanalysis. Both reject their goods, corpuses of truth, recognition, the lack from which there is. We've already talked about the lack of something missing. And because re religion needed this, um, I thought I was going to get through it. Uh, both psychoanalysis uh, and 16th, 17th century mysticism recognise a desire to be done with. Now, this is very interesting because this is this is like shamanism. They both believed in uh, one believed in Thanatos and self-destructive acts, and the mystic wish for loss, loss, loss of the self, the dying of the self, which Ernst did. Uh, he he he, w and this is the painting that he made of it. Which is absolutely one. It's a, an astounding painting, I find. I don't know if you have a view, but um, it's, he, in the it's in the take. Well, it was in the take gallery. It's not anymore. We've got. I've got some handouts here that might be helpful for people who wish to know about it. But uh, if you put a mirror underneath it, it stops disintegration of what it actually represents. Uh, there's the moon, etc. And if you put your hand over it, you start to realise the left legs. Uh, are a female bunch of left legs, and the right legs are also a female left legs. But then you take your hand away, and it becomes far more ambiguous. Suddenly it looks like a homosexual act between what's on top and what's below, or what's below and what's on top. Uh, and the hand, which is like a, uh, a Venus Padula uh, covering the earth, which maintains the shame, and the, or, 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 or implicates the shame. The whistle, of course, being phallic. But the symmetry is important, and symmetry in 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 mystic, in mystic uh, um, and shamanistic uh, symbolism is very very important. Uh, so I've read. Um, now this is the prose that's on the back of a handout that I can hand hand out if anybody's interested. Um, Right, well, we'll keep going, I think. Uh, yes, yes, well, there we are, there we are. Now, this is interesting. Nadia Chaucher wrote a book about the surrealism and the occult. And she talks about uh, Max Ernst's youth. Uh, he got mixed up with the occult, magic and witchcraft, witchcraft in about 1906. And there was this tra tra trauma for little Max. The cockatoo died, his cockatoo, and at, the same, at exactly the same time as it was the birth of his sister. So he, he suddenly became very confused about the identity between birds and human beings. Um, well, so the story goes. Um, he was emotionally labile, had manic episodes, as I said, the bird human identity confusion. Uh, from self analysis, thought he had an Oedipus conflict. Again, if you accept Freud, and only if you accept Freud, which obviously he did. Um, anyway, he died and in, uh, the, uh, on the 1st of the 8th, 1914, but he was resurrected on the 11th of 11th, 1908. And Carrington, Leo, Leonardo Carrington, who he got to, to know extremely well, believed uh, that he was a shaman. This, uh, this was something else that Ernst did, uh, of, a, of a marriage which was quite, uh, it's quite exceptional, really. Uh, again, it's almost as if Le Leonardo is there with the, with the hat, with the, with the, the head of a, a horse, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite a, and this here, that, that, the, 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 the small woman in green at the bottom, that's quite, quite astounding. But anyway, that's something for each to ponder upon. Um, now, dedica uh, dedicated to Andre Breton, uh, the crescent moon stops the little whistle falling on the ground. The whistle because, I don't know, I hope you can all have photographic memories of what was, what was the picture. The whistle became people uh, taking on notice of what it thinks is, cli uh, the whistle is climbing to the sun. The sun is divided into two so that it can spin. Again, the symmetry. Again, the symmetry that was part of Moritz Schraber, the father of Paul Schraber. The right leg is bent. The ha that was a joke. <laughs> They're all bent. Uh, the hand hides the earth. 
uh, though the movement of the earth takes on is, is, is on the importance of a sexual organ. Um, the moon runs through its phases and eclipses with utmost speed, which I'm not running through this um, presentation with, but never mind. <laughs> the picture is curious because of its symmetry, and the two sexes balance each other out. Of course they do, he's got to be joking, surely, I wish I think he was. Um, Schreiber's memoirs relate to Earth symbolism. Geoffrey Hinton, uh, Hinton was very interesting. The main themes in that painting are androgyny, male feminine principles, sun, moon attractions, and symbolism. Although, strangely enough, you've got the moon above the legs. Now, usually the moon comes below the legs. Uh, in many cultures, taking on a feminine aspect. Anyway, a, a, a symmetric balancing in symbolism leading to mysticism, which will again lead to the alchemy of the actual production of a work of art, and the shamanism involved in it. I mean, for example, the, the dismemberment and the organs that were lying on the ground leading to rebirth. And again, the Venus Paducah, the, the, the Paducah, which I was talking about. And also the words and images, because each word is a W. It could represent a way at Weber, but if you put a mirror underneath it, it could also represent an M, which is Max. Anyway, um... Reflections of Schreber, etc. Uh, now, this is quite interesting. Um, much has been omitted, but uh, what uh, do uh, uh, can be understood from the history of his life and his madness and mental, family, psychiatric, and legal persecution? How could art and mysticism, symbolism, and occult be influenced by psychoanalysis? How could they be? Well, they probably, they, 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 he's saying they are. Is madness a creative process for self help? for self-help uh, and almost alchemical transformation. The coexistence of three levels of meaning, chemical, psychoanalytic, and mystical. Chemical being material. Um, now, I, I've learnt is, uh, that surrealism is not just Dadaism, but also romantic and symbolic uh, influences, owing, uh, influenced by a veiled occult at the time. Uh, and as with the unconscious, does not seem to play ball with scientific logic. And that's the interesting thing. Psychoanalysis and its relation to art can help address people's static problems, perhaps help raise personal, personal and social awareness and change perceptions and values and so-called objectivity. That being the point of uh, the manifesto that Breton came up with um, at one point or other. But it's quite a... I'm shooting through something that's very quite... I found very... very Important, but uh, if, uh, if that uh, and uh, psych the, the the psychoanalysis in its relationship to art, each carrying its own logic, and it's uh, you see the, the logic of of a delusion, uh, logic logic of our thinking is not the same. It's it's like the knowledge of fragments. I don't know if anybody's ever spoken to somebody who's psychotic, have they? Yeah, yeah. It's not the same. It's like interwoven fragments. It's glorious. It's, it's astounding. It's beautiful. But it's interwoven. But you can't try and grab it. You can't stick a logic on it. It's no good doing that. I don't think. But that's just a personal opinion. Um, so, um, the unconscious does not play ball with the scientific logic in this case. And the psychoanalysis uh, certainly can... Uh, the, the, there is there is the use of it. I mean, Ernst used psychoanalysis, but that's if you agree with Freud. Now, Deleuze and Guattari came up with this idea that let's get rid of the Oedipus. Let's talk about the anti-Oedipus, which is, let's look at the politics of the fragments of the situation, not just the situation, per se. Uh, can, can we shoot on to the next one? Yes. Uh, so, really, the conclusion is, what do we want from this guy? What do we want from Schreiber, apart from being something we can talk about in his future? We want to rescue Schreiber from Freud and other psychoanalysts to maintain his fame. Um, and imagine a way to stop him being reduced to Oedipus by the Freudiesque and Ernstesques, which is what's happening. Uh, early, earlier cases, earlier um, patients like a Agnes Richter and Babette Est that were treated by Jung, um, there were seamstresses locked in an Austrian asylum, embroidered jacket that made embroidered jackets so intensely that reading it is almost impossible. Treated, treated by Jung, 
uh, he felt that they looked by, and together with uh, artist René Turner, uh, they looked at the embroidery that had no beginning and no end. Some of the things she said about her embroidery was, I, mine, my jacket, my white stockings, that's hypertext. I am, I am Hubert Burr, uh, I live on the ground floor, uh, and then she just said, children, cook, and this is actually in the jacket. This is actually embroidered in the jacket. I am today uh, a woman. Intimate, in, in, uh, institutional, possessive, and very obsessive. I mean, if you just look at what she was saying, it doesn't really matter. This is untamed writing, whatever way. That's the most important thing. And I am what emanates, emanates from me. Well, yeah. This is the highest professorship. Uh, what she's doing is the highest. And I am the double of the banned word. I am the first world of art. Well, I think that says, says it for itself. Yeah, just wind it up. <laughs> yes, I think so. Thank you. Yes. That's right. Yay! we've run out of time the Bowmans we're going to do another one but I think we we booked this room till nine so I think they're going to come in and just basically kick us out soon so <laughs> we could try and do one set if you want to do it uh, and yeah, then yeah. Um, you might they might just come in and like with bulldozers <laughs> you want to yeah. try something oh uh, yeah I, I just like to say that sheets I hadn't did out earlier are from a purely uh, practical point of view, there's no time to kind of do this uh, text piece, uh, you know, simply because it was meant to have six six people, six performers, no time to tell people exactly what to do. So so the thing is, I, I think, I think there's supposed to be a conceptual text piece, but the thing you can do, unfortunately, some people who've had sheets of that's now, now actually left. Um, so if you can find those on the <laughs> floor, if, it, um, if anybody can pick them up, then they'll receive their institution of rock chocolate bar. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry that this um, piece wasn't uh, played. It would take uh, too long, and I think it's at sort of the end of the event. If you'd like to have these back, I mean, back so we can still hand people out the chocolate bars anyway. Well, but, but, yeah, maybe it's well, a thanks, bit thanks for coming, thanks everybody. Too, and we're going to be uh, we're going to yeah, give you out the chocolate bars. Bring the chocolate bars out. It's been a really interesting uh, experience to to be invited here. And <laughs> We've got this handout about um, Ernst and surrealism. Can they keep the pieces? Can they keep uh, them? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, they can, yeah. Keep that. You can take one of these as a souvenir. Something that wasn't ever... Yeah, why not? You can take those as another handout. Oh, mate. Here we are. Thanks to Douglas and uh, for being a fantastic bar keeper. And... Giving out refreshments to everybody illegally, and we're going to probably go to the pub. You know, I'm not sure which pub we're going to go to. But uh, thanks for everybody coming. Thanks for coming today, and we'll be back with more lots of events. Thanks to Kevin for coming. It's Andreen who was here earlier before me. And Nick. And if you want to read the book, this is the Schreiber book, Memoirs of My Nervous Illness. So it's all in here. You know, this is this is the institution of rock Bible, if you like.
good. Yes. Where are these hands? Well, I've got, I've got one. I've got one. <laughs> Um, yeah. Last I'm, word, I'm David. Okay, let me just um, tell you this very quickly. Because I've been very, I mean, over the last few days, I've been very busy in the music stuff. Oh, the thing I'd like to do, I guess, explain to you in very brief. But the thing is, you know, I thought what we could do is swap parts. I want some completely separate things, not the same drums. Also, reading those. Also, reading those.